Uh, well, well, welcome to this lecture organized by the International Association for the Study of Arabia. I am jointly with the Anglo Omani Society. A particular welcome to Stuart Lang, uh, Chairman of the Anglo Omani Society. Um, the IASAF, for those that don't know us, uh, promotes research relating to the Arabian Peninsula, uh, its archaeology, history, epigraphy, languages, it literature, art, etc. Uh, we do this by awarding research grants, uh, producing our own publications, uh, disseminating news of research in uh, Arabia, and organizing lectures and conferences. Our major event is an annual seminar for Arabian studies, which is the only annual international forum for the presentation of the latest academic research on the peninsula. The 21 seminar will take place um, next month over two weekends for, in July with the Casa Arab in uh, Cordoba as our virtual host. And there are two special sessions at that looking at links between Arabian and, and the Iberian peninsulas. Full details on our, of all our events are on our website, theiasa.com. Tonight's lecture on carved doors as historical documents in Oman and Zanzibar and beyond is given by Dr. Janet Purdy, who is the uh, Daniel F. and Ada L. Rice Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow in Art Africa at the Art Institute of Chicago, a position also funded by the Mellon Foundation. Her research examines visual exchange systems of social and cultural trade networks throughout Eastern and Northern Africa, the Gulf region and the Indian Ocean world with a particular interest in the transmission of talismatic patterns and art designs and designs in their protective functions across mediums, including textiles, metalwork, jewelry, and wood carving. She's also curated a number of exhibitions on the arts in Africa and teaches art history at several universities. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to join all of you today. Let me make sure I'm loud enough. Please let me know if I'm not loud enough. A doorway or opening as a definitive physical space often re represents not only a delineation, but also a distinct point of transformation or transition and movement, a threshold, or even a place of danger. Artists of the Arabian Peninsula and Indian Ocean worlds have long applied inscriptions, decorative elements, texts, patterns, and other visual markers to these crossover points as a way to manipulate space and to harness protective powers. In the, in the diversely populated port of 19th century Zanzibar, for example, patrons commissioned massive, elaborately carved wooden doors for physical and spiritual protection of entrances on buildings of all types. On the Swahili coast of Eastern Africa, these site-specific site designs also displayed wealth and proximity to power promoted visual connections to foreign cultures, real or imagined, and manipulated discursive communications for their audience, both internal and external, as part of the translations and negotiations of the complex global exchange systems at play. As an art historian focused on Eastern Africa through the lens of the Swahili world connections, broadly speaking, may I ask everybody to mute, please? I think there's someone that's... Yep. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, as an art historian focused on Eastern Africa through the lens of Swahili world connections, broadly speaking, I investigate stylistic and symbolic connections that reach across trade routes and exchange systems in all directions around the Indian Ocean Rim and into the hinterlands. I focus on definitions of architectural space and adornment in port cities and trading towns, liminal spaces themselves, as they inform our understanding of power structures, cross-cultural communication and artistic exchange. More broadly, I'm looking for the ways the transmission of these patterns and motifs operate in socio-political, cultural, and religious contexts and how they may reveal distinct or shared meanings across different audiences, as in the way these doors, like this door here, is carved with the integration and cross-pollination of cultural aesthetics from Afro, Arab, and Asian material worlds foregrounded and held in one place for all time as architectural adornment. While much is revealed through these detailed visual studies of carved doors as iconic objects of art, it, in my talk today, I will focus on a different aspect as well. I submit they may be read as a set of historical documents, especially for what they might tell us about individual artists, 
their memories and beliefs, their localized practices, and also audience reception, patrons, and more. This is, as Noel mentioned, uh, an ongoing project, a bit of what I've gathered to date so far, and the directions I hope to continue with it. Some of it is based on a few sections from my dissertation, which I just published last August, and leads into my book project on a broader scale. And then this is also pulled from a few of the topics of articles in progress, some of which are in press and some of which I need to conduct further field research, hopefully later this year. So before I dive in, I'll allow me to share this outline for a sense of the discussion to follow. First, a brief overview of Zanzibar and the Swahili coast, just for those not familiar. Then a brief introduction into the doors of Zanzibar and how they fit into broader networks. Next, how I view these doors as historical documents in both intangible and tangible ways. I'll show you a few examples of the way I frame these doors that way with case studies and then briefly what's next on the agenda. Zanzibar is an archipelago in the Western Indian Ocean situated along the coast of East Africa, just south of the Somali Sea. The most prominent island in Guja is commonly known as Zanzibar Island, as you see marked here with the orange arrow. For more than a thousand years, it was a significant trading center in the Indian Ocean, centered in a region known as the Swahili Coast, which is this narrow strip of land that runs along the coastline from Mogadishu in today's Somalia, down through Kenya and Tanzania to Northern Mozambique, and includes all the islands and archipelagos in between. You see it outlined here in, in brown along these maps. Today, Zanzibar is politically aligned with the nation of Tanzania. And while I'm using these maps to situate my talk today for you, a foundational aspect in my work that I wanna would like to share first is the belief that to better understand the arts of Africa, especially East and North and the Horn of Africa, Egypt and the surrounding regions, including the Mediterranean and the Middle East, it's important that we must no longer see the edges of the continent as borders or boundaries. Behind a lot of my thinking is the belief that we must relearn knowledge in a way that reaches beyond, around, and over artificially imposed lines of disciplines and area studies and geog geographic divisions to consider broader systems of exchange that we see on these maps, kind of unthink the literal as a porous geography. For me, that means a focus on the ocean itself and all of, it, all of its malleable edges, reaching outward to the Indian Ocean Rim and beyond, factoring in those confluences that have been in place for more than a millennia and a millennium, and to better understand the cultures art forms and histories of the people for whom the spatial facets of coastal sites that we see rimming the ocean center are located just in the hinterland. But they see them as nearby points that feed into the ocean via waterways or trade routes. And we must think about these sites as a situating point for the doors themselves, thresholds and liminal spaces positioned right at the edge of water and the sea where boundaries and distinctions between the two are fluid where there's an inherent need for protection, protection of abundance garnered from the sea and protection from the dangers challenged by the sea. Someone has some very nice birds in the background, thank you. <laughs> in studying these doors, I aim to demonstrate that type of unrestricted global engagement apparent in affinities and art forms and practices throughout the region. I highlighted here in orange, the, the, the region most consistently visible with the range of Indian Ocean cultural connections through port cities and Indian inland trade centers as connected to Zanzibar, which you see as the star, around which my initial work and research has been focused. And that was also through the lens and limitations of how this region has historically been understood and studied via the monsoons and the way they carried people to traverse them for millennia. And here I'm sharing the far more expansive areas of my developing investigations in my own work that move beyond the constraints of the monsoon paths, the flows that were a focus of the previous map and outside of the thought related to specific bodies of water or linear networks. And now to the doors. 
Said bin Sultan Abu Saidi, who was the Imam and Sultan of Zanzibar and Oman in the 19th century, moved his capital from Muscat. I don't know if you can see my cursor up here at the top, in Oman, down to the island of Zanzibar that we were just looking at, in 1840, to devote his energy to his East African dominions and to capitalize upon the massive economic growth potential in the region. It was later, during the reign of his son, Sultan Said Bargash, Bargash bin Said Abu Saidi, who reigned from 1870 to 1888, that Zanzibar reached a fluorescence in trade and economic exchange systems, which also coincides with the surge in construction of doors throughout the region. When Sultan Bargash added a massive and spectacularly carved door at the main portico entrance to his presentation palace, Sayt al which translates as House of Wonders, in the late 19th century, he impressed a visual stamp of power on a structure designed to monopolize the waterfront and a display of domination. With that poignant marker, Bargosh was forming a new visual vocabulary of his own curation in the same way Swahili artisans have long created what they refer to as their own special design cocktail. This ornamental style proliferates Swahili art and architecture and can be described as innovative designs based in a composite pastiche of images that reflect centuries of African, Indian, Persian, Islamic, Arab, Asian, Hindu, European exchange and other diverse inputs and influences on the culture. The schemes followed by Swahili artisans and Bargash were bolstered by the diverse cultural and symbolic variety available in the vast visual and creative reservoir from which they were able to draw the flow of objects, ideas, languages, memories, beliefs, artists, people, and patrons that pass through these islands and coastlines. Bargash unquestionably worked the hardest of all the Zanzibar sultans to garner visibility to raise his political and cultural profile as one of worldly sophistication. As he assembled his own repertoire of kingly accessories and royal expressions of self-presentation, he fostered a cultural environment and creative introduction of purposeful blending and visual applications. And you see a few examples here from details of the carvings on his uh, front palace entrance door. This clearly served as a model in theory and in practice for others in Zanzibar in the late 19th century. It thus became an incredibly important show of allegiance, not to mention a fashionable statement for everyone from elites to merchants, to farmers, to religious leaders, to those from external countries to follow his lead and acquire a carved door if it was within their reach. We know from oral histories and travelers accounts that ornamentally carved doors have already existed on the Swahili coast for several centuries and have long been revered as visual manifestations of the complex roots and intertwined cultural histories that epitomize the Swahili culture. However, Zanzibar doors from the late 19th century have their own unique visual vocabulary, elevated arguably even above the rest of the Swahili coast region and practices because of the cosmopolitan confluence and that position of global power and wealth it held at that time. What I would call a multivalent, multivocal fashion established by Sultan Bargash in the late 19th century has endured until today on the Swahili coast, throughout the Indian Ocean world and beyond. An ornamentally carved door from Zanzibar, especially one of excellent artistry and craftsmanship with meaningful imagery and iconography is a highly desirable and iconic form that embodies creative creativity and artistry. One Zanzibari man explained to me that to own a beautiful door such as this one, for example, and to pass through it day in and day out is a way of honoring the beauty of the world, the talents that God provides, and to exhibit piety and gratitude as a public facing marker on one's household. A door or entryway like this is a show of faith and identity, but most of all, an object for protection, both physical and spiritual. It is a marker that punctuates the plain surfaces of Swahili architecture to delineate between private and public spaces in these narrow winding alleyways of the stone town in Zanzibar, as you see here, and in similarly structured port cities all around the region. In the middle to late 19th century, enormous and rapid growth 
and global demand for products to pass through and out of the Swahili coast led to extremely favorable terms for Swahili coast merchants. This drew the British, Germans, French, Americans, Portuguese, and other European powers and beyond who were all maneuvering for opportunities to profit. It was in these decades that colonial rhetoric and justifications shifted the discourse about artistic and architectural production toward expressions of power and displays of wealth, and thus undermined the value of local image making practices. The depth of meaning built into the visual forms and innovative carvings was reduced. Those of you familiar with these iconic doors will undoubtedly have heard them described and categorized as either Arab or Indian, or Omani sometimes replaces Arab, where according to these guidelines and style divisions, Arab or Omani style doors as you see on the left are the older versions have always have a square lintel and are decorated with mostly geometric motifs, especially including representations of frankincense and palmettes. The Indian doors, on the other hand, are therefore any that have been carved after Bargash built his Beit al palace. They always have an arch lintel and are decorated with curvilinear vines and other floral motifs. The carved doors of the Swahili coast, all of them, have traditionally been categorized in most every context, including local discourse, popular memory, tour guides and tour books, and publications both popular and scholarly, according to that overly simplified ethnicity-based system. Carvers, however, do not use any such divisions to describe their own work, and it is my hope that we might set these concepts aside and look beyond that system of categorization, for it does not accurately reflect the true history of the art form, nor the complex role of the artists, their innovations, or their communities. Limiting our understanding to two simple style categories obscures a picture of the countless streams and layers of creative input that shape the diverse evolution and designs of these doors over centuries. And as you see here with just a few examples I, I grabbed, you can see the variety of lintel shapes beyond square and arched. And that's just one small example. How I believe if we move past those categories to look at details glossed over and hidden behind them for a hundred years, when we value each example of creation as an individual object and contribution with distinct characteristics, this potentially can lead us to information that might be applied to broader histories and considerations and functions in the same way a record or a photograph does in an archive and therefore as a historical document. One of the challenges in this is that except for in a few rare cases, the identities of individual carvers and workshops linked to specific doors are not known Typically, there's no record of patronage for who commissioned the doors, for whom they were designed or constructed, or when that happened. This is another example of the diversity to be found in artist creations that becomes apparent with detailed comparisons and examinations of the carvings with a closer look at one of, mo one of the most commonly repeated compositional elements on Zanzibar doors. This is a distinctive imagery carved to flank the base of the doorway opening. And I have it marked here on the right with the yellow square and on the left with the highlight. The motifs appear on both sides of the frame and are sometimes doubled or even tripled or appear on the jams on the inside as well. And one of the only early publications in which a description of carvings or designs exists, a British military official who visited Zanzibar in 1912 wrote this in 1924, quote, in every door frame, the designs on the two uprights spring at the foot from fish-like objects, end quote. His observation is still considered and accepted as common knowledge, and that statement has directed the way we frame our understanding of this part of the composition of Swahili doors for the last century. Most everyone you know will simply point out these designs and see fish. However, you'll see in this small sample that I've gathered, the artist carved and abstracted representations of yes, fish-like objects, but also everything from daggers to lobsters, pineapples, lizards, vases, corn, cashews, and all other variety of creatures and vegetation. These designs, which appear on many doors in Zanzibar, but not all of them, were often selected and adapted by the carvers themselves. 
and thus become what I might call one of the first entries into our historical document of the door. There is no existing architectural term for these motifs, this compositional element, so I have I've named them as grounding elements for both their physical and symbolic characteristics. In the composition of the door, the motif at the base of the frames represents a symbolic source and the point from which the rest of the decorative elements grow. Their consistent positioning near the ground and on either side of the door opening underscores that compositional role as an anchor or a genesis point for designs that extend upward and wrap all around the, the rest of the door frame. Carvers explain that the vines and foliation, fruits, flowers, patterns, visual energy, and movement of their designs need a vessel from which to flow and grow, especially as symbolic representations of sustenance and life. That function as a design source also reflects the symbolism and meaning linked to the doorway as that potentially vulnerable point of transition. This location of the grounding elements is the ideal position for a talismanic image or symbolic representation of a protective device as one passes through a liminal space, a point of focus at the transition and the movement from one space to another. And second, its position near the ground is also ideal for imagery that relates to that important concept and awareness of the spiritual power of transitional and liminal spaces that doorways are often considered to be. It's really telling then to consider what type of imagery a carver would have selected for that important symbolic position. And it helps us to ascertain details about his religious and spiritual beliefs, his upbringing or training, what types of images he has seen in his own travels or perhaps on other art forms that he wanted to adapt with his own flair. Such details, I feel, aid in the gathering of local knowledge and in studies of the intangible aspects of these art forms that are often absent from the historical archive. And here's just one personal example. This is the eminent Zanzibar carver, Ahmed Yahya Juma. And he preferred this design that you see on the left for his grounding elements. It's a representation of what, what the Swahili call a guru guru, which is a lizard, I think it's a monitor lizard, that lives both above and below the ground and transitions and moves between the two spaces via holes next to the foundation of the house. So it was important to Yahia for its symbolism and close ties to spiritual beliefs about liminal spaces in the Swahili community. The overall composition of the door carvings and each unique combination of, combination of forms and elements also functions in a similar way and can tell us what visual messages it was important for individuals to present as their public facing architectural markers at different points in time. This door on a two story structure located at the top of the Changa Bazaar Street in Stonetown Zanzibar may have been commissioned by the building's original Shia Ismaili Muslim owner, who had names that would typically indicate Hindu ancestors. So possibly an Ismaili Bora, the owner may have been from Gujarat or at the least probably had Gujarati family connections. And this door is quite an eclectic mix of compositional and design elements. The caterpillar scrolls, if you can see my cursor, I'll put those up here. The caterpillar scrolls up at the top and the lintel uh, were a favorite form, one of the most preferable um, band designs selected by Gujarati carvers. And the four panel gate-like doors, I think you can only see three of them here, but trust me, there's four, are the same form, most likely brought into Zanzibar by Gujarati shopkeepers um, over the centuries of their close exchange. But the baluster columns on the side that you see here, and the, the long line of beading, and the acanthus leaves up at the top, those might have been a direct copy from Sultan Bargash's palace door design, or possibly they linked to the popularity of such of such, such designs that appeared all over Mughal architecture in the 18th and 19th centuries. And if you can see up here, there are three inscriptions at the top of the lintel in a position where typically only one appears, if any. This could have been a case where repetition was used to strengthen them in their role as protective devices. Or it also could have been an effort to underscore in triplicate form the shopkeeper's desire for the protected status 
offered to Indian merchants and financiers by the Sultan and his advisors. A distinct and prominent visual show of the mutual desire between Indians and Omani authorities to integrate both fully into the commercial life of Zanzibar. So looking at them this way, carved doors are repositories of social, spiritual, and technological, technological practices, interregional histories that reflect cultural exchange and artistic innovation. Each one operates in some way as a projection of society at the time it was created and includes not only a unique combination of visual messages, but also important details that reflect individual histories, beliefs, and stories about the actors responsible for their creation and about those in the various audiences who would have lived with them and decoded them and passed by them and understood them. So those were a few examples of close comparison and, and analysis that support this idea of doors as historical documents in intangible ways. Um, as I said, what was important to the artist and the patron and the audience at the time of its creation, how were different values and beliefs and systems combined and expressed in creative and symbolic ways. And now I'll discuss a few of the case studies that show the more tangible ways I can look at doors as a historical document, as repositories that hold and carry details that can be aids in broader historical reconstructions and contribute details about movement of known figures, timelines, and relationships around the region attached to histories that we already might know pieces of. So this first example is a door with a history that spans three continents. Through archival research, I discovered the existence of this massive ornately carved wooden door that once stood at the front entrance of the Sultan's palace in Zanzibar in the middle of the 19th century. Previously unknown, it appears to be the original entrance door for the Beit al Hukum palace. It has been proposed that this door was carved in the 16th century and very likely in India, the compositions, motifs, and carving techniques support, support that it was carved in India, though I have not yet been able to determine where. And like many doors and frames that were pre-carved in India and elsewhere, this door would have been shipped to Zanzibar in approximately 10 to 12 sections and assembled at the palace. Sometime before 1865, a French broker who was on very good terms with the Sultan of Zanzibar visited him at his palace. As a gesture of goodwill, the Sultan offered the broker the chance to select a souvenir of his choosing from the palace. The gentleman chose the carved door and it was shipped to his home in France. Neither the Sultan nor the palace is identified by name in this accounting of the story. However, I've been able to determine that because it happened before 1865 and the second Sultan uh, did not accede until 1865. The Sultan reference must have been the one I mentioned earlier, Said. There are only a few photos and illustrations that feature the front entrance of the palace, Beit al Hukum, and none of them reveal close details. But that same composition and shape is visible and consistent in all these representations. Very little is known or published about Beit al Hukum. It was possibly built around 1840, and it was completely destroyed when British trips bombed the palace complex in 1896 in the shortest war in history, 45 minutes. In researching details about the carved door, I'm hoping to fill in some of those missing pieces. After the door reached France, it remained in storage with the broker's family for over 100 years. In the middle or late 20th century, the broker's niece sold the door through a European auction house, and it was fittingly purchased by the descendants of a French vintner known for his passion for all things Indian. The Hukum door is now installed at the main entrance to the Chateau Castel Tunnel in Bordeaux, France. It would be difficult to find a more appropriate setting in France for this door. The Chateau was built around 1830 by Louis Gaspard, who was a wealthy landowner and vintner whose connection with India was so strong he actually became known as the Maharaja of Santos Death. His fascination with South Asian culture and Asian culture inspired the unique East Indian design influences still evident in the architecture and the interiors at this chateau. The Hukum door includes distinctive grounding elements, those the compositional elements I was discussing earlier. 
And here there are four origin points from which foliation emerges to extend up the frames. At the base of these double frames are realistically carved creatures, one larger in scale set on the wider frame and a smaller, slightly simpler rendition on the narrower outside frame. The larger creature is covered in rows of feathery scales and stands vertically on a fanned split tail with the head facing up to the sky. One thin bent leg with a tiny foot or claw rests on the edge of the frame while the snout curls up and backward into a curly Q form that resembles a short elephant trunk. The tongue droops out over the bottom lip of the open mouth, which is lined with rows of pointed teeth and from which floral vines grow upward. Upon close inspection, I realized that this was the representation of a makara, a legendary hybrid sea creature of Hindu mythology and Asian iconography. The makara is the guardian of gateways and thresholds, and in the Hindu zodiac, it stands for Capricorn, the door of the gods. Makara imagery is considered to be one of the most commonly recurring representations in Hindu and Buddhist iconography for its frequent appearance as guardian figures for throne rooms at entryways to temples, temples and on Tirana or arched gateways as a decorative border for doorways and windows as you see in the illustration here on the right from a shrine from a Buddhist cave. The identification of this imagery further situates the door as, as a really important reference document in a new history with valuable details and relationships not previously known. As a well-known fearsome guardian figure for throne rooms and temples across the Asian world, the Makara would have been a desirable element to feature at the entryway to the Sultan's palace in Zanzibar. Further, its protective and spiritual symbolism as a talisman against terrors of the sea would have appealed to the broader Swahili audience as well. And that meaning underscores why its forms were adopted and adapted by local carvers, requested by patrons, and carried forward in new iterations of new designs. So I realized there is existing evidence of the Hukum Door's influence on the local vocabulary visually in the 19th century. And you can see here one example of several of the large carved doors on the main road, Kenyatta Road in Stonetown, Zanzibar, include compositional elements and motifs that were very clearly copied and adapted from those of the Hukum door. So in this case, the door and its role as a historical document and repository of cultural details will ideally allow me to build further information about timelines and actors and designs as it supports further, further research on all three continents. Continuing this visual comparison for artistic production and timelines of other doors in Zanzibar in places where I wouldn't know the history otherwise. Its original production and artistic traditions in India, if I'm able to track that down, and hopefully greater details about the Sultan, his palace, and his relationship with the French broker, if I'm able to find those records. And my second example, this door, it was carved on Pemba Island in Zanzibar in the 19th century. And I have to say in person was one of the most beautifully carved doors I've ever seen, an absolute work of art. It's now located in the town of Al Mudayrum, south of Ibra on the old caravan route in the Shakia region of Oman. And this door adorns the main entrance of a Sabla, which is a community house that functioned as a center of social life and a kind of transitional space between the supreme privacy of one's home and the wide open public spaces of the souk. In this settlement, which was once a crucial trading center, several Omani families built elaborate mansions, but lived and worked in East Africa, usually Zanzibar. The structures were truly symbolic, stand-ins for their owners, not ever used as a home or a family dwelling. Wealthy Arab merchants or elite families invested great care and funding to establish these as placeholders in Oman even though some of them would never visit or stay at these homes and maybe never even see them. For these patrons, the door was a stamp of power and wealth as that stand-in, but also a protective talisman on the meeting house, part of a community defense system. The realities of life in this part of Oman, it's difficult to access, difficult to maintain an oasis, it's right on the edge of the empty quarter, it's far inland from seaports, but it was essential in its support as a trading site. So the journey of this particular door and its landing in Mudarib represents the fluid nature between the distance and nearness of some of these doors and what they represent, what they hold in their information. 
It can be read in many ways as a marker in the space it occupies now, but also a symbol that represents something both near and far, depending on which way you're looking at it. In its role as a historical document, it's also an aid to identify several individual family histories, those who left Oman for Zanzibar for financial opportunities, but who still cared enough about their Omani roots and culture to create physical markers in the form of stand-ins as Zanzibar doors. And here's a close-up of the, the route it took. It was, it was disassembled after it left the ship and carried overland. And I can also follow the route of this door and apply it in visual comparisons to other doors in the region that were likely carved by Omani artists to examine relationships of visual exchange from that perspective, from the Arab side. And it functions as a, a visual reference and historical document and new geographies for potentially new artistic relationships and considerations. My final example is an iconic door carved by the revered Swahili artist Kijumwa. The life of Ahmed Abu Bakr Omar was influential, creatively diverse and productive and one that spans almost entirely across the colonial period in East Africa. He is known most commonly as Muhammad Kijuma or Kijumwa and was born around 1855, although some accounts report that he was born much earlier and was actually 112 years old when he died in 1945. A woodcarver from Lamu in Kenya. He's also widely known for his major influence on Swahili culture as a musician, an epic poet, and a brilliant, a brilliant calligraphic scribe. His collaborations and innovations were, in effect, a bridge that connected Zanzibar Sultanate court culture, colonial regimes, European Christian missions, and Northern Swahili Islamic traditions. According to his autobiography, he accounts that his ancestors came from Oman originally, born in a village near, near Muscat and emigrated to the Hadramat and then later to Lamu. Also according to, Giju, to Kijumwa, his grandfather Omari was a principal sheikh of Lamu at the time when the first Sultan was ruling in Zanzibar. And then his father held the same leadership position during the reign of Said Bin Sultan's son Majid. And they had relationships with Dao's that they used for trade between Lamu, Zanzibar, and the Comoro Islands. He worked for German missionaries for whom he translated and interpreted, interpreted older Swahili portrait, uh, poetry. But by 1883, he had expanded his artistic training to carpentry. And according to some accounts, invented his own style after he observed and admired the elaborately carved doors and architectural ornamentation of Zanzibar that featured those new designs established there and made popular at the behest of Sultan Bargash, especially those carved for his presentation palace, Beit al -Ajayd. So to be able to connect this many details through history to one, one, one wood carver and the transition and movement of his family and the relationships across cultures, religions, colonial regimes, and such a prolific artist of the Swahili coast is extremely valuable and extremely rare and it's a way to attach meaning and build further insights by adding his carved doors and his other artistic productions to the mix of historical documents. In addition to that, Kijumwa was audacious in his navigation and experimentation with mixing of different cultural elements. And it's noteworthy in one of the most artistically significant and controversial doors he carved. I have this close up here. It's on the west side of the main street in Lamu town. And the controversial aspect comes into play with the imagery on the center post where he carved a twisting snake. It's a little bit difficult to see. Here's the twisting snake hooked onto a hand, which points up to this shape. And written inside that shape is Bundi Kijumwa. So he actually signed his work. According to the carvers I spoke with in Mombasa, Lamu, Zanzibar, Bagamoyo, and more, it was highly unusual to so ob obviously and defiantly sign one's work, primarily because it does not fall under the custom of deferring recognition, recognition and gratitude to a spiritual source, and nor does it support the belief that all good talent comes directly from God. So Kijumwa went against the tradition of artistic anonymity and included a hand in the lintel as his own obvious signature. And he took the statement even further when he arranged the hand, so the hand points to his name, which then points up to the inscription up here, which is one of the most important 
and holy and protective spots of the door. So this act of self-importance places Kijumwen as hubris firmly within the spiritual sphere as the most important aspect of the door. In terms of that door's function as a historical document and the work of Kijumwa in general, it was, his, uh, it was a marker of his ability to navigate different aspects in a quickly changing society as part of his creative output that Swahili people today still hold as foundational to their identity through his poetry and music. And the meanings linked to this hand and the way he carved his name help us to examine those ideas within the broader artistic canon and also their local implications from a variety of directions. And further, his innovations and in carving designs and imagery reach across mediums. And you can see here, there's a, rep a repetition of a design on a kofia, which would have traveled much farther, obviously, than the, do the door. And many more people would have seen this design. And so this helps me to reach across mediums and provide a specific time and moment in history as a comparative reference point for the carving motifs that he invented. So what's next? First, I wanna thank all of you again for allowing me to share some of these insights that have emerged so far through, through this extensive and comparative visual site visits and research throughout the Swahili coast and beyond in Gujarat and trading centers of Oman indicated here on this map, you can see where I've been the last two years. And it takes a lot of traveling and time and questions and conversations and photographs and shared knowledge in this quest to visit as many of these doors in person myself so that I can compare them for direct insights in what I consider the broader archive and to, to place these documents in their time in history and in their time in the artistic process. So it's incredibly important that I acknowledge contributions from all the very smart, kind, and generous people who have helped me and taught me and shared knowledge with me along the way in all of these locations. Nothing would be possible to the degree as this work has developed so far without them. It's a very collaborative endeavor and people have been incredibly generous sharing their family histories and pointing me towards doors around corners and sections of towns that I probably never would have seen. Um, and so I thank them all for sharing their very personal histories and I find them just as meaningful as they do. And they survive from the local perspective in part because they've not been folded into the grand narrative and I'm hoping to do so with respect. So as I continue this work, and draw these unique historical details out from the wider complexity of the forms and the relationships built across these diverse populations over centuries. It's my hope to continue expanding further around Oman, especially to Sharjah and north of Muscat and to the Qatar Pen Peninsula where I see there are similarities to Persian designs and to the doors in Sur and to Southern e India, both coasts and elsewhere in the Arabian Peninsula and beyond, perhaps even Central Asia and North Africa and of course to places not yet known. And so I would welcome anyone who knows of a door that they think I should visit or has a story to share. If, if you would give me the honor to share that with me, please, please get in touch. And similarly, I've also learned a great deal um, and continue to learn from artists of other mediums, historians and friends, and again, kind strangers who, who share and see the important relationships and connections across these different art forms of the Swahili region as you see here with other um, intangible and tangibly similar connections. So I will conclude by sharing my email address here with an invitation again to please contact me if you know of a special door that you think I should visit or you have a cultural history to share with me to expand my knowledge and to build into and fold into these family traditions. I hope that between us, all of us, we can continue to reveal these important connections that illuminate so many beautiful pasts and that like so many doors stand as sentries waiting to be rediscovered. And I thank you very much and welcome questions, comments, observations, if there are any. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's absolutely fascinating. I really, <laughs> I, 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 I hadn't realised uh, that, that uh, uh, yeah, these, these linkages. Um, I, if anyone wants to ask questions, please use the chat function or, or put your hand up or, you know, using the reaction button in the, in the, in the Zoom. I've got um, a few already, so I'll, I'll start with those. 
Um, uh, from uh, Julian, this is for. Uh, so I'll, I'll just stop recording because we're not going to record the uh, the um, Q and A.